So, yes, you can hear me. Hello, everybody. And welcome to my talk, um, OpenSCD, everything, everywhere, all at once. Um, so my name is Tamar Schuss. Um, I'm a software engineer and a lead uh, of the domain development um, at Sprint 1. We are a software company in Stuttgart in the southwest Germany. And I would like to talk about... Hello, hello? Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, what is OpenSCD? Um, just to give you a context, a brief, um, a brief introduction to the history, how it came to be, and where is it today. Um, then what I would like to do, the goal is the talk, is that I um, would like to talk about the challenges we have as a community and which approach we took and which approach we are thinking about. So um, I'm just going to talk about the technical approaches today. So um, let's start. Uh, what is OpenSCD? It's an open substation communication designer. Um, we're going to get into it later, what that really means. And it's also an IEC 61850 tool. I don't know if everybody knows it, but I'm going to explain in a few sentences what it is. Uh, it's a progressive uh, web app. Um, so it's browser-based. And it's also um, a platform. So we think about it as a platform rather than an app. Okay, so just again for a quick context, probably everybody knows for the home or for later for the recording. Um, this is a substation, an electrical substation, and it converts um, high voltage to low voltage and vice versa. And IEDs, so um, intelligent electronic devices, monitor and control these substations, so everything works as it as, as it should be. And the before mentioned, IEC 61850 is a communication standard that describes or specifies how um, these devices should communicate or how you should design the communication between, between these devices. Um, so OpenSCD does something with this, and how it came to be is that at Omicron, um, one of our uh, um, good friend Jacob Fogelsang created a J Java app first because he wanted to help with the colleagues and, 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 and his team to create uh, multi-vendor um, projects because every vendor had its own tool um, and they interpreted everything a bit differently about the standard. So they try, um, they try to, or Jacob tried to create something there where you can, um, you can agree on a software level. So not just a specification, but also agree on the inter inter implementation. Later on, uh, Christian Dinkel joined the, uh, joined the team and they restarted the project as a progressive web app because they saw just how hard it would have been uh, to deploy and to just distribute a Java app to everybody. So they see the web platform as a nice way to distribute the software. Then um, the project started to grow. Um, Aliander RT joined um, Transpower from New Zealand and, and Transnet BW um, from also from Southwest Germany, and we joined with them, um, and we had to create a few plugins for them. And now um, I like to think that we are at a scale, scaling phase. Um, and just last year, a colleague from uh, Aliander, Pascal Wilbrank, and I took over the maintenance of OpenSCD, and um, just last week we have been accepted to LF Energy. So we are ha very happy about it, and we are looking for the onboarding process and and get to know all the other projects too. So these scalings, of course, are, are the scaling problems uh, I think everybody has. Is so we have uh, interest, um, more interest in, in usage, so more usage and more interest in the project, and uh, we face a few challenges. First, um, to get back to the title, so everything. Uh, what we see is if a tool doesn't really provide all the tooling to design substations, then people are going to just uh, use other ones. And we are right back there where we were at the beginning, um, is that uh, the tools differently maybe interpret the specification. And then these designs, so these uh, files are not going to be as much exchangeable as we would like to have. So what we see is that in order to be successful, we, uh, success, um, for we need to provide all the tooling, all the features that the users need. The problem with that is um, also that we have to provide it everywhere. 
um, otherwise a standard couldn't really work. It's uh, already too bad that this IEC standard is not accessible for everybody for free. Um, but even if the software that uses it isn't accessible to everybody, then it's not, never going to work. So at least we, got, we are trying to change that, uh, what we can. So we'd like to really um, make it available for everybody. So all at once uh, means, um, as you may know, in a multi-stakeholder project where everybody has its own deadlines, um, roadmaps, and timelines, um, everybody tries to basically prioritize their own needs over the others because it yeah, makes sense. So this is also what we are facing with all the uh, TSOs, um, that everybody just has a different need. Uh, so um, our approach may be, so not every problem is solvable, of course, with technical solutions. Um, we try to do, we try everything out, but um, today I would like to talk about just the technical ones because otherwise we would be here wrong. Um, one is web standards. It's really important to use them. We depend on them um, for the flexibility and performance and, of course, the long-term maintainability. Then the plugins, we have a plugin system. I'll get into these topics uh, deeper in a bit. Um, the plugin system just helps you customize for every use case you would like. And also the distribution, it's just uh, one step further that you can have your own version from the whole system. So web standards, what does it, uh, how does it help us? So as I mentioned, it's a progressive web app. Um, OpenSCD is browser-based, and uh, what we need also is an offline usage capability because uh, not every engineer has um, internet connection at sites or they would like to browse or uh, design um, the digital substations on the go. So this is a really big point for us. So, and also that, uh, again, as mentioned, installing an app, it's not really possible at uh, big enterprises and TSOs because the IT just doesn't like to install apps. So providing it in the browser, it's a nice way if you have internet connection to have it. And because it's a, a progressive web app, you have to visit it once and then you have it and uh, you can use it at any time. Um, the next one is custom elements as a web standard. Um, so we use it for the plugin system and for, for a few other things. Why is it important for us? Because again, it's a standard and we can, if you can compile to custom elements or web custom elements, then, then we are fine and you can create your own plugins and yeah. And uh, that leads to uh, technology independence because we don't really mind what you are using. Um, for example, OpenSCD is mainly lit JS based, but we have, for example, um, Svelte plugins at um, um, Sprint 1, so we created for Transnet uh, BDW um, Svelte based plugins, and we just compiled to the custom elements and everything works fine. So this is also really nice to, to broaden our perspective and broaden our um, let's say the developer team because no one company or n the companies doesn't have to stick to one technology. Every company can pick their own or what they are best of it or what they have knowledge of and they can just use it. I'm going to show in a bit also how, how easy it is. So let's dive into the plugin system. This is OpenSCD and um, almost everything is a plugin. Um, the menu points, for example, are all plugins. And uh, as an example, the open project uh, opens, um, so by default it opens um, a file locally from your PC. But for example, in our, let's say, sister project in Compass, it's also a, an LF Energy project, they re-implemented it and um, they have a, they have re-implemented the, uh, uh, the open project plugin so that it uh, opens files from the server. And you can do this with everything, yes. Um, even so, of course, saving makes sense too. Um, then the next one is the editor plugins. So this is uh, basically the main content what you see in the middle, and also in the tab bar on the top where you can switch between the plugins. And the editor plugins are the plugins that can really um, manage the the. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. And uh, so the editor plugins can really manage and, and, and modify the design. Um, right. 
And what you don't see is uh, the good thing, it's a validator plugins. Uh, we have uh, by default the standard XML validators and the X, uh, for, for the for the standard, but you can of course at every everywhere you, if you want you can create validators that check from for some semantic meaning. That means if you have uh, for example a naming convention at the company, you can create a validator for it, and then it's gonna tell you if uh, if a naming of a, a device is not correct. Right. Um, so how can you create plugins? Um, it's really simple, I think. Um, it's just an unregistered custom element. Um, so that means, um, if you can see it, hopefully, um, it's just uh, the standard way of creating custom balance. That's, that's everything we need. We don't really need anything much because th this we can uh, load and use. And basically in this function you can see almost everything we need. Um, at the top, uh, highlighted, you can see this, uh, okay, maybe it's too small, but in the top <laughs> we create a custom plugin uh, tag, so a custom uh, HTML tag name for every plugin. This is just to make sure that no plugin are collide. And we do this by hashing just the source. So you can have as many instances of your plugin as you want, uh, if it's necessary, just only the source, so the source URL has to be different. Um, in the next step, we just uh, load the custom element, the, the JavaScript file, and define define uh, uh, or yeah, define the custom element with the already generated tag name, and then render the tag, uh, render the element, put in the HTML in the DOM, and um, give it a few props, few attributes, so it has to have something to do. And the result, the result is going to look something like this, uh, where we have OpenSCD, and inside it we have this plugin with uh, random or, or hashed generated uh, HTML tag. Right. So this is again a, another example. So, um, but this is one of the plugins we created on the left. Um, it's just a small weld uh, component that wraps around the, our own uh, another component. Um, and on the left we have this relatively small um, wrapper custom element that um, the main thing it does is here just basically deploys or, or starts the Svelte component. And why Svelte is pretty good for this use case because it doesn't really have a runtime. So even if you have um, Svelte, so to say, in, in every plugin, you are not going to have anything too big because it just really compiles down to um, basic JavaScript. Uh, in case it would be also possible something similar with React because uh, React also bootstraps similar like this and uh, the only thing is that then with every plugin you would load React.js, the whole library with it, which sounds big uh, or sounds like a problem but to be honest it's once you load, load it, um, the plugin then it is cached and you do not not going to load it every time. So even it would be good with Slack. Uh, with React. Right. So, um, I th yeah, the last thing I think, uh, the distributions, uh, what's uh, one of our solutions which we, we are trying out currently as, uh, for example, it's what already working is that you can already deploy OpenSCD. So you can just take as it is today and deploy it on your own infrastructure. It is just a web app, so it's pretty easy. And it's yours. Um, the other one is add-ons. Uh, we are currently working out to provide building, lock, building blocks so you don't have to use everything. You can use just some of it. And, and it's, easier to, it's easier to recreate and modify it. For example, the plugging system. The, there is a history system where you can undo and redo your actions. And also saving the project and editing. So, these, everything you could replace yourself and make it like, for example, that the editing doesn't happen in the browser, but it gets sent to the, um, to the servers, to the backend, and then everything happens there. So this is what we are working on if to increase, again, the flexibility. So um, again, for the Compass project, it's necessary um, to create new add-ons um, or a new, big right now they are they, ha they use a fork of OpenSCD, but it's uh, not the best solution, so we would like to provide rather building blocks where you can put together your own platform. So, um, and what we saw is creating your own plugins. 
you can do it today um, at any time and the nice thing is that you can load the plugins um, from your local PC so you can you have your uh, have on your PC and nobody can else uh, can access to it but of course it's not the nicest thing to do so you can you can deploy it anywhere and you can um, install it in every distribution so we already have a few distributions and uh, we already have few um, plugins that we use everywhere even and and it's not not developed from the same teams so it's always a nice way to use the work of others yes um, so I was a bit quicker than I thought <laughs> uh, maybe we have a few questions but if you wanna get in contact we have of course the open SCD organization at github uh, we are on the LF Energy Slack channel. Uh, we have a website, and you can try out OpenSCD um, at openscd.github.io. Thank you. Is there any question in the room? Do not hesitate. We have plenty of time. We have ten minutes, so. If you want to ask a question, of course, to Tamas, but two other speakers are, are still in the room, feel free to ask for an energy question here. But of course, priority uh, to open a city. It's post, uh, post break, that's why. Lunch break, everyone's a bit tired. <laughs> we can understand perfectly. We can ask questions to the audience. Oh, that's nice. Let's jump. Okay. IEC 61850, right? You said that. Does it, as, as, apart from explaining, does everybody have any experience with that? Is that something you know of or not? Raise your hand. Not in the energy industry. Okay. <laughs> so who works in, in energy industry? Okay. About half, I guess. Are, are you doing something with energy at home? Home automation, maybe? Okay, uh, uh, yes, of course, you said. Okay, yeah. <laughs> what if you teach energy but not where? It's not industry. Yeah? Uh, teaching. Teaching, no. teaching. Oh, education. Energy, ed education. Uh, yeah. Higher education, primary schools, I don't know. Yeah, so much things. We had the, 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 the own tech, of course, also. Has anybody thought of a question now? <laughs> ah, there's a question. Great. Your hero. I think it's a follow-on from your comments. Um, I'm, I'm coming from a telecoms industry, right? and I think I see a similar problem. The, the, the community is not big enough. The, the energy community is not big enough to sustain these types of projects. I think telecoms industry sees the same. So is there a way that the projects can be widened to get that their scope is even bigger so that there's a much bigger chance of getting a more sustainable community? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah. For sure. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, so like it's what we try to do is, or what I talked about today is a technical approach. One was is that basically having a desktop app is not going to cut it. So you need some some new solution like the web platform where you can really distribute your software to everywhere. Um, and also LF Energy and Aliander already does a great job li uh, with, with um, supporting the open source communities and using their project. It's already really big. Um, how else you can, I think it's really hard to get amateurs, so to say, or, or hobbies, I would say, to the project, because uh, they, the features we develop is not for a week and not for, for a week. The results are really long term. So until we really reach it, it could be years even in the energy, energy industry and in the telecommunication, I think it's similar. So the, the technology, how the technology moves in this industry is quite slow, so to say, or slower, and um, maybe and the rest of the industry. So, how you can um, how you can maintain such a communities? I think you have to get through the chasm, and if if enough people get uh, get to the get to use the project, for example, I think we are. 
either there it, just before the chasm if, because Eliander uses it, RT uses it and Trustnet BW uses it. If we can get a few other TSOs on board then probably we're gonna get over the chasm and the rest of the TSOs going to see this is a nice project and they wanna maybe in get involved too. Um, so that's one thing how you can maybe grow the project and how to maintain the project is of course through foundations and through the companies. I don't see indeed this industry because it's so specialized and because of the closed source or the closed nature of this standard is doesn't make it easier. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dan Brown from uh, Linux Foundation Energy, and uh, you're exactly right. Uh, there are so many parallels between networking and energy. Um, I would say networking and telecom is like 10 years ahead, actually, of where energy is right now, believe it or not, um, where things, you know, 10 years ago, nothing was software defined and that sort of thing in the telecom space, and now it largely is. So we need to go through exactly that same transition. I'm not saying telecom is perfect by any means, um, and there are definitely are not enough people in energy. So it's a matter of getting all of these traditional old school suppliers on board as well, the vendors who have been selling um, proprietary black box systems to uh, the energy industry, to utilities for years. Uh, they need to basically stop doing that and uh, come to it with an open source approach. And so they need to bring in the resources, but we also need universities, we need researchers, we need government, we need the utilities themselves. Um, so it's really a matter of community building and scaling, and it's you know, not an easy task by any means, but that's why we're here um, in hopes that some of you who may not currently be uh, you may be developers in other um, vertical markets or in horizontal uh, industries, uh, horizontal technology areas, who may find this interesting and be inspired and be inspired to, you know, come and join and start contributing um, to these sorts of projects. Um, there's not, you know, an easy solution, unfortunately, but um, we're just doing everything that we can to keep building capacity. How the uh, IEC 61850 uh, uh, market share, the, in terms of number of items, uh, what part of the market of the substation does it represent? Meaning, uh, it, on, on 100 uh, electronics items deployed, how many are compatible with, uh, with, this, uh, with this protocol? So I'm not the best person to answer it. I'm not an electrical engineer, right? I'm not sure. Uh, so far what I gathered is that they are capable of it, so uh, the IEDs, the, the intelligent electronic devices are capable of it. I, I, I'm pretty sure, at least the new, so I haven't heard that they, they wouldn't be, so yes. Any other questions? Maybe to complete what you asked about. Uh, I think that the two last days, uh, some of us were in the policy summit uh, for European Commission. It was organized by European Commission. And uh, we thought that it's very important to um, make a, a, a big uh, announcement uh, on energy and open source opportunity because we all rely our future rely on energy, of course. Our business, everything is relying on the energy. So uh, if we can have uh, fundings and if we organize through foundation to coordinate the effort and not to make efforts there and there and there, I think we will find a great path to have more and more contributors. Yes, you have a question. I just want to compliment, sorry if I, you stopped abruptly, I'm sorry, if, uh, if I cut it. Uh, I think that we, there's a very, in my experience, I, I, I've, in my research in software-defined power electronics is that um, software-defined energy is much harder to achieve than software-defined data and signal because of the fact that there's a lot of current, there's a lot of power, and there's a lot of uh, issues with that and and different use cases require different types of uh, converters and all that. So 
there is, for me, one of the hurdles that we have as a community is is that we need more open hardware as well. I mean, try let's try to do some you know no code with no computer. It's not possible. And we, and we need to if we want to do software, you need a computer. But if you want to do power, you need a power converter. You know, it's a, it kind of goes with the we abstract the hardware because eventually we want to. But there is a there is a lack of hardware, and I think that's a big frame. That's a very very big break on the process uh, because hardware is not only hard, but it's difficult to abstract as well. But we're going to get there.